I want to introduce uh, Matt Jacob, who uh, became the Director of Communications uh, this past summer of the North Texas Conference, and Kim Kaufman, Manager of Web Services. Uh, as they come, are they in the room? Oh, yeah, I knew I saw you, and then all of a sudden, I couldn't find you. Well, if y'all come up, Matt, if y'all come up this way, through the center, it would be easier, I think, and you come to the lectern. But I want to say that uh, the videos that you've seen um, already have been produced in conjunction with a, uh, an outside vendor uh, that Matt has managed so much of this and, uh, and, the, and what we're doing in terms of the development of the website is an ongoing and you're going to be able to start seeing those significant changes after annual conference. Or is the new website up? I don't it's know. up. It's up? It's up. Okay, so the new website's up. Why don't you just announce? Thank you, Bishop McKee. I uh, am glad to be able to come before the conference today and not only introduce myself in the role that I've been in place for 10 months, but also to introduce Kim Kaufman, our new manager of web services. Uh, when I took this job back in August, I said as one of my prime uh, objectives is to redesign our website. And in conjunction and the great work that Kim has done in the last few months since she's been on board, I feel like we have put forth a redesigned website uh, that everyone in this room can and should be proud of. So thank you not only to Kim and for the great work of the bishop and everyone at the conference office, but thanks all to everyone in this room uh, for providing stories that we can communicate to all, not only within the, uh, amongst the clergy and the laity of the North Texas Conference, but also within our jurisdiction and more broadly to the denomination. I'm a storyteller at heart. Uh, I came back to Dallas after getting my master's from Missouri and started writing for the Dallas Morning News. And I love being able to talk to people, to learn what drives them, what moves them, and to ultimately be entrusted with telling their stories. And I feel that is uh, most definitely true for those within the North Texas Conference. We have a great number of stories to tell from our clergy, from our laity, from our churches, and I welcome the opportunity to uh, tell them in many different respects, from the printed word uh, in stories, from the printed words that appear on your screens and social media, uh, to the videos and the pictures that appear on our website. Uh, we really welcome the opportunity to continue to tell the cultivating story of the United Methodist Church here in North Texas. And uh, that being said, I have one set of eyes and one set of ears. So I'm asking everyone in this room uh, to share your stories with us. Send me an email, go to our uh, website, ntcumc.org, and share your stories with us. Drop us a line and tell us what makes, uh, what you might uh, consider to be a story that can be shared uh, more broadly uh, for members of the church, for those seeking a church home, or for those leaders within our conference. Just thank you for the opportunity, and we will talk soon, I'm sure. Thank you, Matt. So welcome, welcome to both of you. Again, new faces and new spaces. This is a this video that we're about to see uh, can be helpful. I think it begins to shine a spotlight on the kind of work that happens in places that really is helpful and transforming in people's lives. Let's see the video about Powderly United Methodist Church. It's not really a town, it's just a community. And um, we have a pretty good Dairy Queen. Subrate recovery is pretty easy to do. It just takes a little manpower. But the only reason we hesitated was because Powerly Methodist Church is such a small church. We really couldn't do much without the support of our community. Um, we have five churches that are support for us and each church supplies a meal, um, each church gives donations. If uh, we have guest speakers come in from those other churches and it really keeps our community grounded and keeps Celebrate Recovery in the forefront of their minds. I am celebrating recovery from an opioid addiction and I was addicted for 20 years and I moved here and I started attending the Celebrate Recovery in Paris and got involved and I really enjoyed it and it kept me, kept me grounded, kept me from 
relapse, which happens anyway. But then um, Mark, our pastor, this is my church, and he came to me one day and he said, how can we help you? Because I had gone to treatment. And when I came back from treatment, he said, how can we help you? What, what can we do as a community to, to wrap our arms around you and, and help you through this? And I said, I'll tell you what, um, what would help is if we could start a Celebrate Recovery group right here. The thing about Celebrate Recovery is, um, you know, we're, we're helping people in a way, at a level that is pretty serious. Uh, Jesus Christ gave his life to help other people. We're not there yet, <laughs> um, but we're not doing nothing. When we go through the step process with the four books, the first thing we do, we get everybody in the group's phone number and their name. And from the first group I went through, I'm going through it the second time now to help the new ones go through. And, but I made friends that I had nothing in common with, you know, I and mean, we got doctors and we got car salesmen, different people like that in the group. And I was thinking, you know, I'm a, you know, an ex-drug addict and, you know, sold drugs to support my habit. But I got their phone numbers and then still, and that's been two years ago when I done that. There's not a week goes by I'm not in contact with those people. Anytime I need help and I got a sponsor, you know, when I get to thinking wrong or there's something bothering me and need to talk about it, I can call him anytime, day or night, he'll be there. And, and I know I can tell him anything going on with my life and he won't judge me or condemn me, he's just, just there to help. It's a joy, I look forward to Thursday nights, the way I look forward to Sundays, you know, because we worship. It is a form of giving. It is a form of helping. And I need to also be doing that on Fridays and Saturday nights, as well as Mondays and Tuesdays. You know, we have Bible study on Wednesday, and then we have church on Sunday. I need to be doing it every day. So we do that on Thursday nights. So the opioid crisis in our country is just destroying so many families and lives. And so we're grateful for a church like Powderly and the pastor, Mark Hutchison. Mark, are you in the room? Hey, let's thank Mark. So. Thank you, Mark, and thanks to the Powderly Congregation for a pressing need uh, in, in the community. And, uh, and that's true in many of the communities in which we have churches. And so, listen, take note. So as we move to the next piece, uh, we had a wonderful celebration of commissioning and ordination last evening. And it was, it was nothing short of magnificent. I mean, I, I, I want to say appreciation to the Highland Park Choir, or choirs. Um, to, and to the Board of Ordained Ministry and all who are responsible for last evening, thank you very, very much. But we want to hear from our ordinands, and so I want you to, to watch what our ordinands, uh, what wisdom may they, they may be imparting for us. So most of my time at First Richardson so far has been in the development of creating um, a new space for new faces. Um, we opened our new facility uh, in January of 2016, and since that time, um, we have seen many new faces come through. And the words that I continue to come back to as new faces come in those doors is um, trust and truth. And um, the problem with that is that we often trust people that look like us and act like us. Yet the truth of the gospel is that we believe in the body of Christ and that metaphor and image means that we're not alike. Um, we don't see things the same way and we don't act the same way. And for the body of Christ to be effective and functional, um, we can't all be alike. And so um, I continue to feel called to create space for those new faces because that's how we are functional as the body of Christ. Well, I didn't grow up in church, and I started going to church when I was a senior in high school and into my college years, and I went on the invitation of friends, just really on their elbows. And I remember all the questions that I had and, and how I felt at church and, and really what it is to be new. And so I think about that whenever I think about the congregation I serve and, 
And even when I get a phone call from a wife and a mother who says that her husband's an atheist, but he's willing to come to church with them, and, and so I think about the questions that he might have, and, and how does it feel to him, and, and I even think about the young adult who, who came to me one Sunday and said, uh, I decided that it was time to come to church because whenever I became an adult, I needed a church, and, and now I'm an adult, but I have no idea how this works, I don't know what the Bible is, and, and what should I do? And so I think about those people when I think about new places and new spaces and new faces. I think the primary way I feel that God has prepared me to gather new faces in new spaces is by giving me the privilege of being the pastor of the Feast community. For the past three years, I've served as the pastor for the Feast community, which is a weekly worship service with the special needs community. About three years ago, I felt inspired and convicted by the Holy Spirit to start this service. And I've seen this idea of new faces and new spaces manifest itself in two ways. First is individuals who, for whatever reason, were unable to attend regular church on Sunday morning are now are able to come back into the local church or maybe even come to the church, local church, for the first time with their families and friends and worship every week. The second way I've seen new faces be brought into new spaces is that the feasts were all about empowerment. Individuals with special needs read scripture, pray, lead music, singing, signing, help with communion and the offering. And in all these ways, I'm seeing that new faces are not only being brought into the local church for the first time or back into the local church again, but they're being, new faces are being empowered in new ways, in new spaces in our worship service. So it's really exciting to see that dynamic. I think for me, God has prepared me in two different ways. Um, as, as I think about preparing uh, new spaces for new faces, uh, the two things that I've been taught is to be patient. And uh, that if we really are intentional about building new spaces uh, for new faces, that we'll be patient enough to, to really do it right when we uh, start to develop and start to uh, make new new spaces. The second thing is never accept failure and to always keep trying. Um, sometimes it's okay uh, that we don't always get it right the first time, but then we learn from that uh, and, and we do it better the next time. But we never stop trying. We never stop trying to change. So growing up, I always felt really drawn to different age groups. So I remember distinctly in high school, I was really drawn to older people. Uh, in fact, I used to uh, go to really cool scrapbooking conventions uh, with people that were like 40 years older than I was, so I was super cool. And um, I've just always valued people older than I was. But as I grew up, I always really valued younger people. And I was always drawn to student ministry. And so I feel like in my lifetime, I've um, always been looking around the table to figure out as everyone represented it. And I would like to say that I had always been looking for new faces, but I kind of got really content with who I knew, who I was comfortable with. And I think in the last couple years, I have realized my privilege and I've been really challenged by different voices to make sure I am looking for the new faces um, and really make sure everyone's fully at the table. I think we've kind of tricked ourselves thinking that everyone really is welcome and we haven't done a super good job of that. And so I feel like God has been really preparing me and molding me to look outside my box, look outside my world, um, into places, into people that maybe I wasn't always comfortable with or didn't feel like I had a lot in common with. Um, but realize that they very much need a, a seat at the table and how together we can do really great things and really start to look like the kingdom of God. Well, I think that God has made me by nature an includer. And so that means in any setting that I'm in, I'm kind of always looking to the edges to see who's not there, or who's missing, or who's not participating fully or who's not always kind of being included, whether that's in a just a youth group setting or a church setting or in the neighborhood or society. 
I'm kind of always, uh, I'm just geared towards looking at the edges and uh, seeing how God is moving me there. I hope that God continues to use me despite myself um, to work for and to strive for full inclusion of those with special needs and disabilities into the life of the church. We're doing really well on some levels, but we have a ways to go. And I just hope that God continues to give me the insight and the courage and the clarity to, to work for inclusion and also just obedience to follow where God is leading me. Well, one of the things I love is to help people really discover who God has meant for them to be. And that could be through, through a vision statement or, or it could be how it's expressed in their careers and, and really how they live out their faith. And I think so often that, that we just live life and we go from one decision to another and think about you know, the boxes we need to check. And, and I love when people really discover the vision that God has and the calling that God has for them. And I think about when I do premarital counseling and, uh, and I talk with the couples and say that your marriage is not just about you being happy, but it's about you being a blessing to each other and a blessing to the world. And, and how might you bless other people through that? And I was even working with an older couple and they were coming to the end of, of their retirement and professional years and, and they were talking about all this extra time that they had and, and I offered up to them, well, well, how might you bless other people? As you come to the end of your careers, you could be a mentor for a generation that's looking for mentors, and, and you have opportunities and extra time to, to volunteer, and, and I could just see in their eyes how, how excited they were as they began to catch a vision for this new phase of their life, and for me, that's about helping people discover who they're meant to be. So I learned really early on in ministry, actually in children's ministry, um, that God was not calling me to have all the answers, that God was calling me to be faithful. And I want that to continue to be lived out in different ways, whether it is sitting at the hospital bed or uh, talking to someone who is struggling in their faith or talking to someone who has even given up on church. And God doesn't call me to have all the answers. God has called me to be, to be present and to be faithful. And that's one of my hopes. My other hope is to have a, a ministry that is about a resilient faith. Um, that's the story of resurrection. We are all broken and we all will stumble and have those moments in our lives when we feel like everything is coming to an end. Yet the good news of our gospel in Jesus Christ is that um, we are called to have a resilient faith to get back up again um, and that death does not have the last word, not in this life or the next. I think it's tempting in ministry or in, in any career uh, to want to be successful. Um, and for me, you know, it's tempting to want to have everything that I touch uh, grow and be super vital and be uh, the most important thing that's ever happened in, the, in that church. But I don't know that I'm necessarily called to be successful and called to be faithful. So my hope then is by being faithful to that gospel that uh, people's lives will be transformed um, and that we will begin to realize that this uh, family of God that is present on, in heaven, can be made real on earth, and that we can all be um, part of that no matter our ra age or race or creed or background or uh, orientation, whatever it might be, we are all part of this family and meant to, um, meant to do this together. I've realized in the last few years as I've been leading a congregation and spending more time with people is that people don't really want super flashy, polished, ministry or leaders that have it all together. I think there's been a hunger, not only in the church, but just around the world to have leaders that don't separate themselves so much. And so what I've realized is I've been able to offer myself as vulnerable and transparent and authentic. And I think people really find that refreshing. People really love when I share what I'm going through, what challenges me, what I have a hard time with, what I don't understand, and inviting them over into my home for dinner or calling them on a Saturday and say, hey, let's get our kids together and go on a play date or inviting them over to watch college football on a Saturday. I think there's something about being accessible and realizing that as pastors, Yes, we're, we're set apart, but how are we really with our people that we're leading? And so showing that we are with them and we are for them and that we're growing alongside of them, I think has been 
the biggest success, I guess, in my ministry, and I hope that carries me, that I never forget that um, I need to be with the people and not to be so confident and make sure that I'm not so set apart that I'm not accessible. Um, I think for me, the way I hope for God to work through me uh, is to help me to be a really um, great leader uh, and, and pastor to every church that I go to. As we celebrate this, uh, this year, 50 years of the United Methodist Church, that uh, we work together to remain united in this United Methodist Church. And, and I hope that, my hope is that God will continue to work through me as a leader no matter where I go to help uh, maintain that unity. So moments like this, when you see uh, our ordinands, our newly ordained persons speak, uh, provides even greater hope about the future of the United Methodist Church, and especially the North Texas Conference. So this, this is a brief deviation in the agenda. So Reverend Marty Soper and Reverend Emma Williams from Center of Leadership Development are coming, and they're going to be referring you to an item of action that is required. This action is required because of the uh, action of the General Conference in 2016 related to the sexual harassment of clergy by laypersons in the local church. This is, um, this is work that Marty and Emma will explain to you. Given, uh, given our work yesterday, albeit brief, on amendment number one, we want to be reminded again about the importance of this. We want to, this begins the work that will continue over this year and in the next year as well, related to uh, a very good place in terms of helping our churches and, and encouraging them to develop a policy or at least mirror the ones, if not even strengthening it, the one that comes from the General Commission on the Status and Role of Women. Thank you. Reverend Soper. Bishop and members of the North Texas Conference, um, thank you for the privilege of being able to speak on behalf of sexual ethics in our conference. The North Texas Conference of the United Methodist Church is committed to the well-being of all United Methodists in the conference and to maintaining healthy relationships between pastors and persons that they serve. In light of the increasing national awareness of sexual harassment and, and abuse that has gone unreported, there is a need to re-emphasize in the North Texas Conference that we have a zero tolerance policy regarding any sexual misconduct either by clergy or lay people. The church should be a safe space where all people are valued as children of God. And those who have, have experienced hurt within its space, where, uh, in it, in, within its walls, should be supported and protected. The Book of Discipline 2016, paragraph 605.9, requires that the annual conference adopt a comprehensive policy for handling sexual and gender harassment of clergy when laypersons are the perpetrators. This policy shall guide the local church in how to handle the report, how to care for the accuser and the accused, the victim and the perpetrator, the findings and the settlement. It shall make provision for support of the pastor and for care of the church members. With that in mind, I invite you to turn to pages 48 through 54 in the annual conference workbook, which offers a clear process for both clergy sexual misconduct against a lay person and misconduct involving a lay person against a clergy person. Starting on page 51, we find the process for when ministerial professionals encounter boundary violations, sexual harassment by congregants. These pages cover the annual conference suggested process for a clergy person who has experienced boundary violations by a layperson. It also makes explicit the policy of our annual conference, which defines sexual misconduct according to the 2016 Book of Resolutions, number 2044, and the 2016 Book of Discipline, Social Principles, paragraph 161.j. This is our policy as a, an annual conference. 
After listening to the concerns of clergy women in our conference in many different ways, including leaders from our clergy women's group, meetings with the bishop, uh, district superintendents, CART team professionals, members of the Center for Leadership Development, and members of COSRO. The guidelines on pages 48 through 54 are directly from our General Commission on the Status and Role of Women. These guidelines create a clear but flexible process for our annual conference, understanding that all situations are different and the needs of the clergy involved in these situations as they are um, victims of harassment by members of their congregation, the needs of those clergy are sometimes different as well, and they can vary greatly. Most importantly, the guidelines utilize the expertise of the CART crisis teams that have particular training to care for both the victim and the perpetrator and their families, as well as the congregation as needed. In addition, provision has been made for any clergy person to contact a person outside the official CART process in order to have a confidential conversation about moving forward and discerning next steps. Our response guide also encourages, and this is really important for local churches, that all local churches create a policy regarding gender discrimination and harassment in your local setting. Uh, the, uh, the policy that is in the workbook also makes reference to the General Commission on the Status and Role of Women's website, umsexualethics.org, for more information on creating a policy tailored to your context. You can find these links on the conference website under Leadership Resources. It is our hope that the annual conference will continue to refine this policy under the guidance of COSRO, the standing committee required by our discipline, particularly after the upcoming sexual ethics training required of all appointed clergy, and under the guidance of Becky Posey Williams, who will be visiting with us from General Committee uh, Commission on the Status and Role of Women to conduct that training. There will also be a number of people from COSRO um, and our CART teams who will be attending the quadrennial training, Do No Harm, which uh, takes place in October of this year. Uh, after those events, uh, we surely believe that we will be in an even stronger place um, to refine the policy as you find it in your workbook today. With this information before you, I would ask the, the annual conference to vote to accept this sexual harassment response guide as our conference policy and process for responding. Okay, so this is before us and it doesn't require a second. Um, remind you, we are, this is to, to do to be in compliance with the Action of General Conference in the Book of Discipline, as Reverend Soper has said. And so I want to thank Reverend Soper and Reverend Williams for their work upon this. I, I sense, does anybody want to speak? Microphone three. I'm ben Hensley, Oakland United Methodist. Uh, just a point of information. Are, are we voting to adopt a report? Are we voting legislatively to amend the current sexual misconduct policy that is in the standing rules? I just want to make sure we know what we're doing. The report in the standing rules, the first page of that, is a policy that defines sexual harassment. That has been updated by the 2016 Book of Resolutions, which is contained in the report. And so uh, it is my understanding that if we adopt this report, that the report will be the policy. Um, not to, and That's the problem with having it in the standing rules. So it is our hope that um, the report that we are presenting today can be the guideline through which we can clean up any kind of discrepancies that exist between the two reports. The, the, the passage that is uh, the piece of the legislation that, or the piece of the report that has to do with um, sexual harassment by a lay person against a clergy person is not found in our current, current standing rules. 
So it is that piece that I am most concerned that we adopt today to be in um, good standing with the requirements of the Book of Discipline adopted in 2016. So will we, um, if I may continue, will we uh, move or will we do something that ensures that legislation will update the standing rules in 2019 as a part of this? Or So let me answer that. Uh, Reverend Smith uh, said yesterday that one of the things, that, I believe it was Jody said this yesterday, that. Uh, during the standing rules report is that we want the policies that affect uh, the North Texas Conference to be policies and not loaded into the standing rules, which makes it more challenging to keep up to date. So this policy will be effective immediately upon your passage, and this is the way we will operate in the North Texas Conference. Are we moving the current sexual misconduct policy then out of the standing rules? Because it's currently in there. Yeah, I think this enhances that policy, and we'll be operating from this policy. Another question? Are you ready to vote? So I've been making a mistake, and I want to apologize for that mistake to uh, uh, persons from the deaf community, our brothers and sisters in the deaf community, because I've been asking for yays and nays. It's just what I natu naturally gravitate to, and I want to apologize. So we will do this by the show of hands. All those in favor of the policy that has been presented to you this day, will you raise your hand? Can you hear now? Can we get... Can you hear me now? All those in favor of adopting the policy that has been presented by the Center for Leadership Development, will you raise your hand? All those, thank you. All those opposed, will you raise your hand? Okay, this passes with one negative vote. Thank you. Excuse me, I just saw one hand, two votes, two negative votes. So at this, I'm finding my agenda again. So at this point, we're going to hear the lay reports. They're going to be in a different order than what are, uh, um, you can see. The first is the clergy spouse. A, a report. The second is the young person's address, and the third is the lay at the address. And if you will just come to the microphone uh, in, in that order when it comes time, and I won't introduce each one. But this one, I'm always delighted to hear what's happening. Good morning, Bishop McKee and members of the North Texas Annual Conference. My name is Sarah Stobaugh, and I serve as the president of the Clergy Spouses Group. The Clergy Spouses Group is open to all spouses of clergy, male or female, young or mature, or anyone in between. We gather several times throughout the year for fun and fellowship, as well as our annual retreat, which is always awesome. Please feel free to find one of us after the presentation or check out our Facebook page at North Texas Conference Clergy Spouses for more information. You know, we are all proud to be clergy spouses, but it's not without its challenges. We're, we've prepared a short video for you. We hope you enjoy it.
Thank y'all, and we appreciate your ministry as well. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay, so we begin with the lay reports. Well, the, the, all of them. Yeah, the young, young first. There you go. and I'm a chaplain on CCYM. Will you all please bow your heads and pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in this time to give thanks. We come to you as humble servants whose tattered clothes are stained with sin, yet you still accept us with open arms and wash us clean. Lord, we thank you for accepting us and sending your son to teach us the way to follow you. I thank you, Lord, for seeing the youth as part of your church now not just the future of it. I thank you for these opportunities we are given to share your love and mercy through our words and actions. I pray that our words will be full of your spirit and have an impact on each person we encounter in and out of the walls of these buildings. Holy God, we pray this in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. At this time, will you please help me join welcoming Emma Piacun, our incoming chair of CCYM. for that introduction. Good morning, Bishop McKee and members of the North Texas Annual Conference. My name is Emma Piakim, and I am the incoming chair of CCYM. CCYM is honored to be here representing the youth of the North, North Texas Conference, as we do throughout the year. CCYM is a diverse compilation of youth from junior high through seniors and high school from all four districts. This past year, the youth of our conference engaged in several successful events that we would like to highlight today. Our cornerstone project, the annual Midwinter Retreats at Bridgeport Camp and Conference Center, brought together 434 youth, youth workers, and volunteers from across the North Texas Conference over two weekends. This year, our Midwinter theme, Follow the Yellow Brick Road, explored what it meant to live your life differently as a Christian. Midwinter is completely run by CCYM students. Youth facilitated small groups, Youth facilitated small groups, gave testimonies, led prayer, led music for worship, and organized fun activities. This year, we piloted a new midwinter opportunity, discipleship groups, where students were given the opportunity to learn more about being called to ministry, work on a local mission opportunity, share best practices of youth group games, discover their leadership style, or ask questions about faith in college. Midwinter is a place where students and adults can grow in their faith and in their connection to each other. It is also an opportunity to raise money for our Youth Service Fund, or also known as YSF. This year, we raised money during our midwinters through a snack shack and a competitive Dorothy vs. the Wicked Witch competition, so graciously headed up by two of our CCYMers who volunteered to get slimed for the fundraiser. 
Our 2017-2018 YSF funds will be put towards the Beanie Bag Project, a mission nonprofit started by some of our own North Texas CCYM alumni, as well as towards the National YSF Fund. Over two weekends, the youth of our conference raised $3,000. Although Midwinter is our biggest event, we also had sef successful youth-led district events in the fall, which engaged churches across each district in meaningful fellowship. Youth also had the opportunity to participate in the One event, which had 315 people attend, and our annual Bishop's Rally had 350 participants. Make sure to stay tuned in to ways you can help or get your youth involved in these awesome, ac awesome activities and more coming this year. Okay, so this is normally the part where I would flip it over to the outgoing chair, Anna Shipley. But unfortunately, Anna Shipley is taking exams so she can graduate on Thursday. So she is not here. So I will be reading in her place. Good afternoon. <laughs> I want to start by thanking Bishop McKee and the conference for giving us this opportunity to reflect on all the great things that have happened with our conference our conference's young people this year, and for all the support our conference gives young, to youth in general. I see all around me young people who are challenging themselves, growing in their faith, and engaging each other in Christian fellowship. This year for the address, I reached out to youth workers in our conference with a series of questions for their clergy, youth, and youth volunteers. Throughout this address, I want to highlight some of the points they made that I believe truly embody what is so incredible about the young people we have in our conference, as well as what I see our young people doing. When I look at our conference, I see young people organizing, leading, and engaging in passionate worship. I hear proud voices proclaiming God's love through song, and see joy in creative and active worship through dance and motions. And I'll just say on my own behalf, as Anna, of my own singing skills, it's a good thing I, it's supposed to be a joyful noise, not necessarily a pleasant one. From my questions, I heard again and again about the impact of worship on our young people. One high schooler who participated regularly in youth band said, it is the most impactful part of my faith. There's just something special about getting to help others experience God. The spirit is moving in our youth during worship. To quote a few surveys we got back after midwinter, an adult volunteer said, I love that the youth band made it about worship and God and not themselves. And regarding our youth led testimonies, said that they were the best part of the weekend. This attitude also extends to prayer. I hear and see our young people faithfully praying for our bishops, our clergy, our churches, and our congregations. I hear them listening and faithfully playing, praying for each other and with each other. And finally, I hear them leading prayer for others and writing powerful messages that inspire and reveal God through the Spirit to others. The young people of our conference are empathetic, compassionate, and caring. These qualities are exemplified in, what, in that they are advocates for themselves and the marginalized. John Wesley once said, what one generation tolerates, the next generation will embrace. When I look at not only my peers, but the children as well as our, of our conference, I see that embracing. A youth pastor described her youth as picking each other up when the world around them is crumbling. They are a unit and a family. This is the love and fellowship I see in our young people. I see youth engaging in intentional and hard discussion, trying to find common ground and loving each other despite differences in beliefs. When I asked, what has a Methodist, has being a Methodist done to change your life? An eighth grader responded, saying it changed the way I make decisions and how I act towards others. And when I turned to ask a youth, youth volunteer what volunteering with youth did for their faith, she said, it was life-changing the way the kids challenged me to think differently and to read the word differently. I hear young people asking hard questions and creating forums for themselves to ask them. I've seen small groups engage in faithful conversation and seen young, seen young people listening, supporting, and respecting voices they may not see eye to eye with. And I'm not just talking about youth. As a camp counselor over the summer, I have witnessed the children of our conference challenge not only each other in very meaningful spiritual conversation, but counselors and directors as well. I am so grateful to be in a conference that has so many opportunities for youth to be open to incredible mentors, retreats, ca camps, events, and more that provide chances for them to experience the spirit and grow in their relationship with God in exciting ways. I see young people going outside the walls of the church and taking their faith and their hearts on their sleeves. When I asked youth what being a North Texas Methodist meant to them, I heard these answers. It's letting God's love shine through me to other people. It means home and it means passing on God's love to other people. 
Our youth are first and foremost interested in sharing Christ's love. Missions and service is just one of the ways our young people are doing it. A really amazing example of this is the Youth Service Fund, which is money raised by youth in our conference, which this year went towards the Beanie Bag Project, a nonprofit created by past youth of our conference.